Welcome back to the Apatros Review. In this episode, the D Spectrum 3, Part 1, 75th episode marker. Now, welcome back to the Apatros Review. This is the third installment of the D Spectrum, a running special where I look back on the worst films I've covered on this show between this and the 50th episode. Even though I've now reached 75 episodes, I have gone through my fair share of shit, and it's always fun to knock down bad films like Bowling Pins in a Bowling Alley. Anyway, this is split into two parts, since I've reached more bad films than I would safely fit into one episode, so keep watching in a few days for the second half. For each film, I will mention which episode I covered it in, give a brief synopsis and a review, and explain my reasons for my grading, as well as briefly explain what DVD was released on, if applicable. So here goes. Pulse 2 Afterlife. This was, uh, came out in 2008, it was covered in episode 51. And I gave it a D plus, 3 out of 10, meaning it was disappointing. This was the first of a two film project that Near Art and Logic, a company whose bread and butter work was making cheap director video sequels to the films that Dimension Films had in their stable, and released through the short lived Dimension Extreme video label. Many people like to joke that the extreme suit for the extremely poor films that the label put out, and universally hated by fans of B horror. The director, Joel Swazen, who is notorious in the industry for being a hatchet man hired to fix other people's projects, wanted to show Dimension that he could make a low-budget film with the same amount of VFX shots as his typical big-budget blockbuster, but for a fraction of the budget. So the producers agreed, and Suarez and Neo Art and Logic went ahead with making two ridiculously cheap director video sequels to the very underwhelming 2006 American remake of the abstract Japanese ghost story Pulse, or Cairo in Japanese. The result with almost every single scene shot in front of a green screen with the locations digitally added in post and with some wildly uneven acting from half the cast, only Jamie Bamber and the actress playing young daughter get away with decent performances, was a complete disaster that just about nobody liked. Or for the second sequel, Pulse 3, with its sparse minimalism and stronger, more poetic storyline about a teenage woman coming of age in a post-apocalyptic world, what's possible at best? And this thing pretty much sank the idea of putting green screen location shots, effect shots in every single scene for now, although somebody somewhere might revive this idea in the future. As for the DVD, this was released onto Region 4 DVD by Real DVD, a subsidiary of Roadshow Entertainment, which handled various roadshows, reissued the catalogue and just about all of the Dimension catalogue locally. Now, Eager, directed by Archul Sr. in the year 1962. I covered this episode in episode 54. My grade, D-, minus, meaning it's shit, 1 out of 10. A classic Z movie that the bad movie cult loved to parade around as a familiarly dodgy movie, this tale of a prehistoric caveman who lives in the same section of Bronson Canyon as the Roman from Robot Monster, and who has survived the ages by drinking sulfur water, and gets a host for a local teenager, much to the chagrin of her wannabe rock star boyfriend, whose guitar is a magic instrument that can play bass, backing vocals, just about every sound except for actual guitar sounds, is a really turgid piece of trash that somehow managed to earn back its $15,000 budget of borrowed money in one night and more to some of a million dollars. What makes such a cheap piece of trash like Ega such a legendary bad movie is not necessarily a story. It does make a certain sort of sense, and while the plausibility isn't exactly in this movie's side, at least it could have made sense in a dumb sort of way. Or the technical side of things. The camera work and editing were professional enough for this sort of budget. Indeed, I've seen similarly budget films worse handling than this. Or for the film was dubbed in a mediocre fashion after it was learned that the sound recorders goofed off and failed to record much of the sound, resulting in them having to follow most of it in, resulting in some Italianist dubbing clubs, like the Watch Out for Snakes line. Or even the soundtrack, those ballads that Archibald Jr. sings are undeniably vapid, but do get easy on the ears once you're used to it. No, instead, what the one thing that makes Ego such a cinematic hand grenade is the way it's handled. The film starts off pretty decently enough, but once the caveman Arrives back at the cave of a bouquet of locally picked flowers, the unintentional laughter really kicks in and Iga pretty much stays that way for the rest of the film. The standout moment remains the infamous moment where Marilyn Manning proceeds to give Richard Kiel's caveman a shave, cutting off his beard while he's licking up the shaving cream. Pretty disgusting thing to see, if I've seen worse than this, believe me, and somehow having his hair slicked back without actually seeing that happen on the screen. The film even does its own El Cheapo version of King Kong's climax, only switching the Empire State Building for your standard pool party, complete with Iga bonking police of a pool ladder and getting shot numerous times before falling dead into the pool, while Arch Hall Sr. misquotes the Bible about giants. The quote is technically correct, but he gets the location of the quote wrong. 
is actually Genesis chapter 6 verse 4. In all, a pretty crime, prime contender for the worst movie ever made. My pick would be Man of Stands of Fate and Beastie Flats, and a laugh ride for devoted bad movie cultists and champion hecklers. This film is available in public domain for their restored versions on Blu-ray. Yeah, Militia, Jim Wynorski 2000, covered this in episode 57. Gave this a D, 2 out of 10, meaning it's poor. Ever since the starring role of Superman in the cult 1990s TV show Lois and Clark, Dean Cain has not had much of a strong profile. Instead, winding up being stuck in the realm of B-grade action films and thrillers. It's a bit of a waste, given he's actually quite a good actor. But Kane manages to be the top drawer of the cheap B-grades he's been featured in. Militia was one of those cheap B-grades that Dean Cain does for his brand butter work. I actually reviewed this film in the same episode as uh, Fire Trap, another Dean Cain film that he did after this one. The film was directed by a director I'd love to hate, the infamous hack Jim Wynorski. Under Wynorski's direction, Militia is pretty much a dud. If it wasn't for the blatant thievery Wynorski conducted by stealing footage from one of my favorite films, Terminator 2 Judgment Day, and sending it into his film with some subtle changes to make it fit the storyline, I would give Militia about a D plus or a C. For a stock footage helicopters that constantly change shape, to the little things that showed this production done with values that are really dishonest, and a basic lack of fact checking. No US law enforcement officer will go into on a mission with Russian made military hardware, or the rampant use of stolen footage for the masking of the budget. It's really a pretty shoddy film, but Wynorski is a pro, and the same technically all form up the lowest grade. Now, Palace Entertainment released this one to various multi packs. Queen of the Amazons, Victoria Sala, 1960. Reviewed this in episode 60. My great D minus, 1 out of 10. Shit. One of an insane number of Italian peplum flicks that were made between 1958 and 1964. The Peplum is basically the Italian quasi-historical mythical strongman fantasy, where both immortal and mortal beefcakes go around ancient locales, saving damsels in distress, undertake perilous quests to save whole kingdoms from hostile intruders, battling, battling various ugly monsters and doing a whole plethora of lifting large styrofoam objects, using said objects to knock down whole armies like bowling pins. The early Peplum, decent enough, but by the time of 1964 this genre really had nothing more to say, and the majority of people made at the end of the cycle pretty much atrocious, except for a few rare examples. As in the case of Queen of the Amazons, known in English releases Colossus and Amazon Queen, which is what my public domain copy was sold with, director Vittorio Sala decided to make the most of the beaten track route for Peplum by turning this into a comedy. The film was construed as a sort of parody of the whole Peplum genre, and given the crud that would follow through in the dark in the early 1960s, this is the most worrying idea. While the approach had some merit, not to mention some decent production design, I like the interesting military uniforms Amazons wear one breast poking out of that uniform, but for this film covered with red cloth to avoid pissing off any senses, this was made in 1960 when most markets are not used to new teen mainstream drive-in fare. The film's main problem is that the moronic, slapstick, and at times severely chauvinistic humor and overall sex attitude in prison men towards women enslaving them was pretty much condemning this film to the trash can cinematic history. It is also very annoying to watch. I personally had to speed scan my way through it. By the way, speed scan is where you watch the film entirely in fast forward only stopping in certain sections to pick up vile plot points or to see the best parts of the film without having to wait for the rest of the film, to avoid getting brain poisoning. Rod Taylor must have had been seriously hard for the cash to make something as idiotic as this, but that said, nobody had any excuse to make a film as bad as this, or for the side of men being turned to ahem, indentured domestic household engineers, my term. It's pretty funny. You give it some thought. If that wasn't bad enough, the film's director of photography, certain bitter Albertini, but later gone to make one of the very worst Italian Star Wars knockoffs ever. The soft core space opera erupted against the third galaxy, aka Escape from Galaxy 3, also known in some places as Star Crash 2, which combined the stories of Star Wars with the post apocalyptic soft core sex romance of awesome space jargon dialogue. Now, this is available in public domain. Sanctimony, Uber Bowl 2000. I covered this one in episode 62. I gave this one a D, plus, which is a 3 out of 10, meaning it's disappointing. A mysterious serial killer and labeled a monkey maker by the media for the nature of his killings. The first six victims had their eyes cut out, the second six lost their ears, and the last three so far had their tongues removed, has been striking American city at night. In quotes, film was shot in Canada. Police detectives Jim Renault and Dorothy Smith are in the case, and they believe they have a lead when a highly successful yuppie named Tom Turner claims to be a witness to the monkey maker's fourth tongue victim. But what they don't know is that Turner it was actually a massive egotistical sociopath is actually a monkey maker himself. Having seen and owning many of the films made by cult 2000s filmmaker Uwe Boll, I'm one of the small number of critics who don't necessarily share the majority's opinion that Boll is the worst director ever. There are plenty of other directors I can name off the top of my head who are a good deal worse. 
As for sanctimony, Bull was ripping off the likes of American psycho, cult thriller, but highly successful world street yuppie, but seriously kill mean streak, and which gave Christian Bell a good deal of clout. Bull repeats the plot of that film here, but in the realm of the B budget, with a distinctly weirdly odd vibe that might rouse the interest of certain movie fans, even for the script that Bull wrote himself is far from the standard Bull attained with the serial killer films he made at the tail end of his film career. The film goes from one moment to the next with an off kilter pace and mood that will probably disorient most of those who haven't seen enough bad movies, that even experienced genre fans will be shaking their heads in disbelief of some weird shit that goes on here, with the snuff film that Michael Perry narrowly misses on catching, the strangely unrealistic office cast with the Fed Ian works in during the day, the TV talk show has the most uncontrollable guests, the cops' constant conversations on everything from the coffee to the human spirit, to one cop stripping nerve as pregnant wife's fashion shoot, and for that matter the fact that Michael Perry being the only one cop who drives to work in a VW Beetle, Eric Roberts doing another ham sandwich and minus supporting role, and the final climax where after massacring a TV talk show host, Van Dien heads to his ex fiancee's breakup party and pre pretty much demolishes the place of pretending to be the Yun Fat character from a John Woo film. The film's plot is pretty dumb, and Bull by this point isn't exactly good at writing, but he'll get better at it, and the best purpose that Sanctimony has is as a practice shot to in his style. A bad film given sharp functional mediocrity thanks to its seriously weird vibe. Bull got a whole lot better with his next film, the school shooting drama Heart of America Homeroom. Now, Magna Pacific released a cropped but uncut version of the film Region 4 back in the early 2000s. No supplement about this. Now, Makista and the Queen of Samar, or also known as Hercules Against the Moon Men, directed by Giacomo Gentiloma in the year 1964. I covered this on episode 64 as a peplum double. Now, I give this one a D, which is a 2 out of 10, meaning it's poor. Hercules, in actuality, Italian Southern era superhero Makista, sort of a cross between Hercules and Doctor Who, takes on the plight of the poor people of the Kingdom of Samar, teaming up with the local resistance movement to bring down the evil queen and defeat the alien army of three meter tall rockmen who look like a well placed thing can tip them over. Of course, in my review, I joked about that these things don't have any bill of rights in the UN, so if you want Luna sourced marble for your finest Italian marble kitchens, go over to Samar. Don't quite know where that place is, though. Maybe that's why the Moon Men are still there, watching the world go by in their cave, wanting to build up the numbers from the local quarries and take over the world. Of course, we do have by now the weaponry to deal with to them some serious ass kicking, mainly sledgehammers. And take your pick. Just watch out for them ganging up on you. If that happens, kiss your ass goodbye since they'll pancake you alarmingly easily. The film, which was originally a late period Makista film called Makista and the Queen Samar, but retitled Hercules Against the Moon Men for international release, very few people outside of Italy at the time even knew who Makista was. So it was redubbed Hercules. But it's pretty bad stuff and one of the worst among the last bunch of Italian peplum films that came out the following year in 1964. MSC3K did an episode of this, if you must know. And the film was actually available in public domain. And that's it for the first half of D Spectrum 3. I'll do the second half in a few days' time, so keep watching. A lovely followers and fans. That's it for this review.